Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to those who are watching at home. Glad that you were with us as well. And to you here, asking you folks here to uh, use the pew pads, if you would, and send them back around so you know we are worshiping with in your pews this morning. A couple things to share with you. Um, the flowers this morning are from uh, Kim and Deb Newman. We appreciate them very much having some fresh flowers up here. That's very neat uh, for that. Um, on our class that we're doing on Genesis, the next two weeks are going to be about Joseph. Um, and I've got the movie um, for Joseph, and we're going to show it on Thursday afternoon in the library at 4 o'clock. Whether you're a class member or not, if you want to come see the movie Joseph, it's a pretty family-friendly friendly movie. Uh, and uh, tell us about you through the whole story of Joseph uh, in the musical. Uh, that has been on Broadway and it's been done all over the place. But if you want to see the movie of it, um, I think Donnie Osmond's in it, so that might give a little encouragement to come. Um, and welcome to join your, join your group on Thursday for that. Now uh, we'll have popcorn. So um, if you want to come, that'd be great to have you join us for that. Um, you have done a really great job this morning of spreading yourself out. It looks like you spread offense for the Packers, uh, from my standpoint here. Uh, but you did a nice job of kind of getting all over the place. Um, it's amazing to me that in one week, Green County went from a low number of COVID cases to a high number of COVID cases. It happened in a week. Um, this particular version is very uh, contagious. Um, the good news is it's not as fatal in terms of its effect on people, but it's still a, a disease and one we can spread. So thank you very much for spreading out, and uh, I encourage you to be careful in group places over the next couple weeks anyways until that situation changes some as well. So, but good, good, good job today kind of spreading yourself around and, uh, and I think you can go ahead and sing today because you let yourself spread around. So grab a hymn and sing along. We welcome today all the way from Florida. She heard I was speaking today, right? Molly, you heard I was, yeah. <laughs> she heard I was, uh, she had to come up to hear me. So, Molly's over here, Pam's daughter from Florida, so um, came up to a big up a little bit. You may remember her as a star in one of our Christmas plays, okay? Yeah, she's still receiving the money from that, um, from that performance. Yeah, from her mom. Uh, <laughs> Molly, good to see you. Glad, glad you're with us today. So I will give you a chance to stand up and say hi to your buddies around you and welcome everyone today in church. And we'll get family use of power. So I'm all up there. Good morning, everyone. Let's join together. Please remain standing. Let's join together in the call to worship. Be glad in God and rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy, all the upright of heart. God has called us by name and poured out abundant mercy upon us. God has multiplied our resources and blessed us with food for our body and soul. Christ dwells in our hearts through faith that we may be rooted and grounded in love. We come seeking a new vision and to hear a new song. May God, God bless, bless this time of worship that we may grow in faith and in love for one another. Please be seated.
from our spiritual selves, we come to this time of confession seeking wholeness amid a fragmented world. The false promise of a good life filled with things has created a barrier among us. There are dividing walls of hostility separating God's people. We are called to admit our role in this brokenness and seek forgiveness. Please join me in the unison prayer of confession. Blessed Redeemer, have mercy upon us as we confess our sin. We have the with the goodness which we ponder our blessings. Jesus made much out of almost nothing, and yet we never seem to have quite enough to satisfy our needs. We yearn for possessions that our neighbors enjoy quiet longing for material riches, and help us to trust in Jesus, who provides for all our needs. Help us to rethink our lifestyles and become more faithful to receive God's blessings. Amen. All who truly repent can know the fullness of the love of Christ that surpasses human knowledge. Through Jesus, we are restored to new life in God, our Creator. We are thankful that we love be, that we loved by God and given freedom to live in the light of the teachings of Jesus and the Bible. Thanks be to God. I'm just going to do the children's sermon from here. Because there's one little lady over there, but we'll have her stay around one day, very long. But just a quick little word that I want to share, and it's one for all of us, really. And that is simply that um, God has bestowed upon us talents and gifts. And they vary from person to person. And what you may be good at, your next door neighbor or your husband and your wife may be kind of lousy at, and vice versa. And um, in a group like the church, that we kind of just think of each other not as individuals for a minute, but as a talent or a gift giver in the congregation. And the beauty of that in the congregation is that no two gifts and talents are exactly the same in this group. Some of you like to make calls on other people. Some like to work in the kitchen. Some help out in the office. Some count money. Um, some do ushering, some do all kinds of stuff uh, in the life of our church. And that's the beauty of a congregation, in that all those gifts make up who we are as a congregation. And our congregation is different than the one next door. There may be some different gifts over there at the Catholic Church that we may not have in our congregation, and vice versa. Um, and even though this is talking to adults, I always want to let young people know that they have gifts too. And I think one job of us as parents and grandparents, and maybe great-grandparents, is to allow those gifts to surface in our younger generation. It's kind of easy for us as adults to say, oh, we can do that, don't you have to do that. And yet you're not allowing them the opportunity to do what they might do quite well. Um, and to nurture those gifts as they're growing up, uh, so that those gifts become more true in their lives, more active in their lives, and they get to recognize their gifts. Um, in the church, we call that discernment. And discernment is discerning what gifts were given, God given, to us to go into ministry. And so in seminary, we spend a bit of time in that kind of thinking what gifts do God given us and how can we use them best in our lives and in our ministry. Well, that same discernment, I think, happens to young people. To discern what they want to do, what they can do, what they're good at, and what they really enjoy doing. Um, and so part of our job as a congregation, I think, an important one, is to help nurture those gifts in our children and grandchildren and great grandchildren and to allow them some space to try them out. Because you're never quite sure until you try them out. I know some things I've tried out didn't go real well. I played violin for about 15 minutes. 
<laughs> that was the end of that one. Um, but I don't think too bad it turned out. Uh, but it took a while to figure that one out. You know? And so you don't always know immediately that's what God's given you to do. Uh, and that's that discernment process where you spend time, you who are older, my age group are a little bit younger, you think back, there was some time where you probably spent some time thinking about what you wanted to do and what you were good at. Um, and you may even have taken a couple jobs that didn't go real well. Because it just wasn't up your alley for what you like to do or what you could do well. And part of that is listening to God. Part of that's in prayer. I don't know how many people really do that, but I think for me, that's been a very important piece of me finding out things I like to do and want to do and I'm good at. Uh, it's also listening to one another. A lot of times people will come and say, boy, that was great, you did a really wonderful job, and that's affirming of a gift. When you say that to somebody, you're affirming their gift. You say, boy, you sing really well, you play organ well, or you dance really good, or you're a really good speaker. Whatever it might be, it takes people to kind of affirm that gift for that to kind of be installing in something you feel comfortable with. So, as you leave today, just kind of think about people you know where you can affirm gifts in others. And if you're still kind of searching for yours a little bit, but I think it happens in all ages, uh, don't be afraid to let God in the equation. Um, to ask God, what kind of gifts do I have? And how can I use the best in my family, in my town, and here at church. Amen. The epistle reading today is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power of, to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Our gospel lesson is one that you are probably familiar with. It's the feeding of the 5,000. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii would not buy enough bread for each one of them to just get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. There was a great deal of grass in this place, so they all sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When it was satisfied, he told his disciples, gathered up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered it up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, 
they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus did not yet come to them. The sea began to get rough because of a strong wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and maybe the boat reached the land for which they were going. May God's blessing in his holy word for use and understanding in our daily lives. Let's pray. Most gracious Lord, we ask that you be with us today in this holy place. That your word will inspire us and lead us to greater faithfulness and love for our brothers and sisters. We thank you for these stories that have been passed around and long to us from long ago. And they've had meaning for so many generations. And now for us today. Amen. I'm willing to bet that pretty much all of you probably recite that story from memory. The feeding of the 5,000. Of course, you just heard me read it, but you know the story. It's one of those wonderful miracle stories in the Gospels. And each of the evangelists uses these miracle stories for different purposes. For the writer of John, the miracles function as a series of signs that point to the glory of God revealed in Jesus Christ. The progression of signs during the book of John intensifies as they move through the Gospel until at the very end Jesus is raised from the dead on Easter morning. That's a really big miracle, standing above all the rest. Just one quick side note here. John connects many of these miracles to existing Jewish festivals and holy days. The feeding of 5,000 takes place near Passover, because that's the festival associated with Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt, the ultimate slavery to freedom story. Jesus later put to death on Passover Eve, by placing these important events on Jewish festival days might be John's way of saying that Jesus is the new leader for the Jewish faith community. Well, getting back to our text for today, as well as we might think we know the story, there are always a few little details that seem to get overlooked. This happens for several reasons. Sometimes the story is told in more than one gospel and varies from one gospel to the next. The feeding of 5,000 is one of the few stories, believe it or not, is found in all four Gospels. They're always not exactly the same. For example, we know the Christmas story that is found in both Matthew and in Luke. Well, Matthew tends to tell Joseph's side of the story, and Luke tells the story more about Mary. And if you only read one of them, you'll say, boy, there's some stuff missing here because it's in the other gospel. Um, and so it's easy for us to kind of get excited about these stories and kind of miss an important detail that might be in that gospel but might not be in another one. The case in point for today's story, because all four gospels have this, but the question is where does the two loaves and the five fish come from? Well, if you're reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the fish and the bread just show up. They just come out of the crowd and there they are. There's no one telling you where they came from. They just arrive on the scene and then the miracle happens of the, uh, making it into a meal for everybody. Um, but in John, we get a little detail that's not in the other three. And I always get a little suspicious when one gospel has a little detail in it that's not somewhere else. And my thinking is that someone, an eyewitness, or somehow that got passed on as something someone saw. Who brought the fish and the bread? It was a little guy brought it. 
I remember he was back in the crowd and came in. And that's how sometimes those little pieces get into these stories. Uh, who brought the bread and fish? It was a little kid, water. Imagine such a small and rather insignificant gift become the focal point for a tremendous miracle performed by Jesus. Now this could have gone, the story could have gone a lot of different directions. What if the boy was not interested in going to see Jesus that day? I wanted to go fishing myself and never showed up to that big gathering of people on the hillside. Or maybe um, uh, he uh, brought the bread and brought the fish and gave it to his mom and dad. So let's all have a little deal right here together. But no, he's the one that brings the fish and the bread to Jesus. No, he's the one that disciples Jesus. How many times have you felt, and maybe didn't that, that you felt that you would be missed if you didn't attend church today? Or maybe you um, feel that you're not that important down at the club or something, and choose not to do something. And yet this story, that little guy decided to show up, number one, share what he had, which wasn't much, but was enough for Jesus. And there it was. And here they are out in the middle of nowhere. There's no McDonald's, no Burger King out there, and certainly five loaves and two fish were not going to go very far. And yet, we hear of a miracle that 5,000 people. Now, some people think whenever the Bible is counting people, it sounds a little sexist, girls, don't get upset. Um, but they're only counting men. <laughs> but that's often they count men, but not the women. Um, so it could have been a lot more poor children than that. So it actually could be a lot more people with 5,000 men. But really, he gives up his bread and his fish to the disciples. And so for me, that little boy is a model for a faithful disciple. He is, first of all, gathered with the body of Christ. He freely offers what he has to give to others. Now, in the grand scheme of things, a couple of fish and five loaves seems like a pretty small potatoes. But every gift, especially when multiplied by the grace of God, reaps a large harvest. And one thing I've learned in 60 years of being a Christian is that you never underestimate the power of God to make great big things out of what seems ordinary and small. At some point along their spiritual journey, I think the disciples found that out. It took a while to get it. I think they realized that as they got farther along in the Jesus ministry. Quantity was never an issue when you're cooking with Jesus. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, proclaims this simple truth. He says, now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask for or imagine. That's a pretty neat line. Here it comes again. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask for or imagine. Ephesians 3.20 When we live in Christ and Christ dwells within us, there is nothing that can't be overcome. It's much like what happens in sports teams. I've coached volleyball, and in several cases, I had probably the best players of any team around us. However, if they didn't play together, we lose games. I've also had games where I've had a bunch of gals that were good players, but they really played well together. They knew what they were doing, they knew what each was going to do, they called out their calls, they did all the things you're supposed to do, and those kids won games. And more importantly, they won friends, and more importantly, they learned the lesson of sharing and working hard together. Paul sees this same kind of dynamic happening in the church. When the members of the body of Christ share in the work of the church, 
freely giving their talents, their time, their resources, whatever they may be, then miracles begin to happen. Every gift is deep important. Every talent is utilized. Every gift is multiplied to the glory of God. And once you get headed down that track, watch out. For this train is bound for glory. I closed this morning with this story. And Lynn knows who this person is. In our church in uh, Rockland, we had, uh, no, it's Sparta, it's good, church up in Sparta. We had a young lady in the church, I think got there when she was like maybe third or fourth grade. It started off with her playing the piano a couple times in the church, she would take a piano lesson and play some simple little stuff. But then she moved to flute, and often she accompanied us to play flute in church and do that. But after confirmation, she came to me one day and said, Tip, um, I'm wondering, do you need any teachers in church school? Well, yeah, we could use some teachers in, te in church school. Well, Jill took on, I think, a bit of fourth or fifth grade class uh, all by herself. We had a superintendent who kind of wandered around, but they think Jill's good. But one year, she turned her whole class into a jungle. I mean, there were plants and birds and all kinds of stuff in the walls. She spent hours in there working, getting the classroom ready for her kids. And every week she would be in there teaching and working with the kids, and sometimes they'd be singing, sometimes they would pray. And, um, Quite frankly, of all the teachers I've had over the years, I put Jill in the, category, in the upper category of being one of the better teachers we, we've had in our Sunday school all the years. Well, she went on to college uh, in uh, Iowa, and sure enough, today she is an elementary school teacher at a school in Iowa, been doing that for quite a while, and I'm sure she's one of the best teachers in that school. The church nurtured that gift. I'm sure if I looked through the Constitution, I could have found the thing saying, you have to go to 21 to teach in Sunday school. Is that in our Constitution? I don't know. No, okay. Or you have to be over 18 to stay in the fire. Or right, whatever it might be. And I've had people go up to me and say things like that. And I'm awesome. And um, my response is to them, a simple, I think it will be okay. I think, we'll, I think we'll be okay. And we'll help them. We'll watch over them, make sure they're kind of on the right path. But that nurturing of Jill and our congregation, and the congregation was very supportive of her, not just me, but the whole congregation, sent her on a pathway in her life that she never backed off. I've also seen that with kids that were like a little older than Jill would be who went to camp to be counselors. And how that has changed your life to counsel at one of our church camps through the summertime and have that experience of working with each other and managing eight or ten kids for a week, um, week after week, or whatever they might be sharing in that situation, to go on and use that in their lives uh, later on. I hope that you might have one of those stories in your life or in your family's life where through that nurturing and loving process, you change someone's direction to a very positive place, and that they became people who share that gift within the context of some part of the church, whether it be here a church church like this, or a camp, or some other place where they might have had a chance to do that. What I hope you take home today is that God has gifted each one of you. And that hopefully at this point in your life you figured out what that is. But if you haven't, keep working on it. But to use your talents and gifts and more importantly support your neighbors as they share their gifts and talents in the church. And miracles happen. Real miracles happen when we share our talents and gifts that God has blessed us. So may God bless your talents and gifts and may you share with each other the joy and the grace 
here at St. John, in the name of Christ. Amen. We lift up many in our congregation today that uh, we want to remember, uh, not just here, but in our prayer time at home as well. Um, we lift up the family of Mary and Sperry, and uh, service was held, and Mary Gaffney did that service, and we ask your prayers for that family. In the hospital, at last we know, was Susan Abrams, and uh, also Kim Redford. In hospice is Louise Wells. Uh, cancer treatment is Jeannie Drake. We also lift up these other requests for Shirley Schumer, Alan Ells, Steve Strike, who is here today. So Steve could see you here. And Mike Krebs is not in hospital. I understand he's now home and receiving some therapy. We also got a note this morning, which is not in the list up there, prayers for a human hundred. Um, now she's a resident at the hospice home, so please remember her uh, and keep 
keep from you in your prayers as well. You know, always remind you of letting us know when you have a relative or friend that's in the hospital or a nursing home. Um, those are difficult times for the family and so we will be glad to visit them if we know that they're there. Let's bow our heads for the depth and height and length of our service here at church depends on so many things. Part of the gifts that we offer in our tithes and offerings to this church are part of the gifts that we need as a congregation to continue the work that we do for our congregation, for our community, and for our country. Give generously online or today in your tithes and offerings.
please join me in our prayer of thanksgiving. We join with Jesus in giving thanks for the little things we can see, that our eyes may be open to the greater possibilities we have not imagined. May our efforts be multiplied by your grace, so there is more than enough to feed the world. May our spirits be lifted so that we have the confidence to be more giving, more loving, and more joy to bring hope to our neighbors and friends. Amen.
as you're out doing your business and your chores, that little things can make a big difference. And God's in the picture. Go in peace.